My name is Darius Sneakers. Uh, welcome everyone to the EU uh, Policy Lab for deep dive uh, dialogue this morning. Uh, energy transition, a one-off opportunity for the EU industry and its competitiveness. Um, for those who don't know uh, me or my publication, Recharge uh, we, uh, is the name. Uh, we launched in 2009 uh, as an all renewable energy uh, weekly newspaper. We've evolved a great deal over the last 10 years. We are now very much digitally facing uh, rechargenews.com. If you want to look us up, uh, we cover wind, solar, storage, uh, the overall energy transition globally. We have around a half a million viewers, uh, viewers, readers every month online, and we have a, a, a bi monthly magazine. I mean, I don't need to tell anyone here, of course, that we are facing currently the greatest crisis in human history anthropogenic climate breakdown. And this climate breakdown, of course, knows no geopolitical boundaries. It doesn't respect socioeconomics, race, or gender. But like most crises, it carries with it an opportunity. Much as we are in the midst of a climate crisis, we are also already on our way to a civilization transforming shift, <coughs> shift away from fossil fuel-based power systems that have turned the planet for the last 150 years toward one powered by renewable energy currently led most obviously by wind and solar power. Renewables are on track to account for over 80% of total electricity output by 2050. Wind and solar power will be expanding over, this, over the course of this time by 20-fold. If you um, read the DNV GL's uh, latest energy transition outlook, you'll know this transition is gathering pace, but as is being belatedly recognized, not nearly fast enough. On current trajectories, we can expect the world to be 2.4 degrees hotter in, in 2100 than before the Industrial Revolution. Now, this is significantly lower than the World Meteorological Organization's report, which pointed toward a 2.9 to 3.4 degree temperature rise. But either way, this is global heating of a catastrophic level and far, far beyond what the Paris Agreement targeted at 1.5 to 2%. Right now, we're on a road <clears throat> to a place that no one wants to go. Yet perversely, it's not for lack of means that we find ourselves here. In the same DNVGL report, the calculation was made that if we were to install three terawatts of wind and five terawatts of solar power, and that was switched on by 2050, and this is calculated eminently affordable and industrially achievable, then the Paris Agreement's 1.5 degree target is within reach. <clears throat> but what is somehow more inspiring than this is that in accelerating the energy transition, we would be simultaneously undertaking a new industrial revolution, a green industrial revolution, one that creates millions upon millions of jobs. If you read the most recent International Renewable Energy Finance, uh, excuse me, Renewable Energy Agency's report on job creation, we would move from, from 10.3 million clean energy jobs in 2017 to around 23.6 uh, million jobs in 2030 and over 30 million jobs in 2050. And of course, that would have a knock-on positive impact on myriad other aspects of global society. There was a report by KPMG recently for Siemens Gamesa, the, uh, the German-Spanish uh, wind turbine manufacturer, that said a transition of this sort would offset 5.6 billion tons of CO2 by mid-century, which is equal to the annual emissions of the world's 80 most polluting cities. And by doing this too, we would set ourselves on a course to be conserving 1.5 billion cubic meters of water annually by 2030 and reducing air pollution, which of course would cut the global health care costs we currently see by $3.2 trillion a year. And that, of course, is just with wind. If you add solar to the mix, then you can at least double this or treble this figure. So what about here? What does this mean for Europe? Not least at a time when the European Commission's president-elect, Ursula von, uh, von der Leyen, on one hand, has stated the ambition that she wants to make Europe the first climate neutral continent while in reinvigorating the EU industrial leadership. And yet the incoming EU energy commissioner, Kadri Simpson, rather <coughs> unenlightenedly has, seen, has said she sees gas as perhaps the most cost efficient option to wean Europe off coal. So to discuss this and much else, I'm sure, challenges and opportunities, uh, we are very fortunate to have with us today on stage three men who have spent much of their working lives considering key areas in this running debate new technology, industrial growth strategy, environmental policies, environmental politics. From my, um, my immediate left, Heitze Siemer is head of the New Energy Technology and Innovation at the European Commission's Director General for Energy. He started his career in EU-Japan relations. 
uh, following on with work in development of EU's trade policy dialogue with, with civil society. He was instrumental in developing the blueprint for Europe's maritime policy. From 2008 to 2018, he led a number of, of different teams at the uh, Director General for uh, Mare on the development of blue growth strategies, EU legislation on maritime spatial planning, the EU's international uh, ocean governance strategy, uh, and on innovation research and investment uh, associated therewith. Uh, to, his, uh, to his left, Matthias uh, Machnig is head of industrial strategy at Inno Energy, as you all know, <laughs> Europe's uh, sustainable energy innovation engine. He was formerly Minister of Economics, Labour and Technology in the German state of Thuringia and State Secretary of the Federal Ministry of Transport, the Federal Ministry for the Environment and the Federal Ministry of Economics. Matthias joined Inno Energy to support the development of industrial strategy as well as working with the European Battery Alliance, and we'll come back to that, I'm sure, to help transform sustainable energy and automotive industries. <clears throat> to his left, Peter de Pus is Senior Policy Advisor at the Climate Change Think Tank, E3G. Peter's an expert in EU environmental policies, politics and strategies, and is supporting E3G's work on the just transition in Germany and the CEE countries, for diplomacy, as well as developing E3G's <clears throat> strategy for the EU. Prior to joining E3G, Peter worked for the European Environmental Bureau, which is the EU's largest in environmental umbrella organization, and played a leading role in campaigns to preserve <coughs> Europe's flagship conservation policy, Natura 200. Let's open the discussion. I'd like to give each of the, um, each of our, our, our panelists the uh, opportunity to say, fundamentally, challenges and opportunities. What could the European, uh, what could the energy transition mean to Europe and Europeans? And uh, I'll lead off with you. Sorry. Uh, good morning. Um, first of all, well, you know who I am now. Uh, and basically what my team does in the European Commission is we look at energy technologies and how they can contribute to the energy transition. That's the short story, I think. I'm for the first time in this event, and I love it already. I think, the, you know, as a, as a kickoff, I think this is just exactly how it should be. And maybe to be a bit provocative at the beginning, if you think about uh, today's energy system, and you look at the panel sitting here, which is um, three um, slightly over middle-aged guys, then you have a picture of what the energy industry is like. And that is one of the things that needs to change both in terms of how we're equipped and how we think and how we work. But that's kind of the general picture. But let me give you a, a few things also from the engine room in terms of where we stand uh, content-wise. The first thing is you've heard a lot of figures already from Darius about the, um, <coughs> uh, the energy transition per se, the challenges that we have. You know what kind of targets we set ourselves in the European Union, 32% of renewable energy sources by 2030, 32.5% increase in energy efficiency and so forth and so on. You also probably are familiar with what we call the long-term strategy document called the Clean Planet for All, which really sets, tries to set out the scenarios as to how can we get to net zero in 2050 and there's all sorts of different options there. I think the main message there is really it's work in progress and if and you'll be aware of this but if you look at the curve in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction it's not a flat curve it's not a curve where you say we start and then we go gradually towards net zero to somewhere in 2050 but it's really a, a logarithmic curve uh, an inversed one which goes down ever steeper the further you advance and that's really the challenge that we're in for the moment um, I'm not entirely sure that I'm altogether that optimistic. I think the, op the official messages we're getting towards our 2020 targets, uh, we're almost there, there's still a few things to do. Well, we're almost in 2022 as well, but anyway. Um, but, you know, we're getting there, uh, and with all the work that we're doing, we're reasonably confident we'll get to our 2030 targets. But then you see IPCC reports that put us in the realm of, you know, somewhere between 2.8 and 3 plus uh, degrees warming. And that's a sobering thought. So what is really the thing that, that we're trying to look at? The one is, for me, that what we need for the energy transition, first of all, is we need deployment of clean energy technologies at an extremely rapid rate. And what is not so much in the discussion, I think, is that most of these technologies are already there. We have them. The only thing that needs to happen is they need to be scaled up, their cost needs to come down, and they need to be put far more into, far more quickly into the market, into the market uh, conditions. And one of the things, obviously, that Inno Energy does is to try and contribute to that uh, that particular exercise. 
The other thing that I find is absolutely central as well is that in order to achieve that, at least by our conservative estimates, you will need annual invest investments of somewhere between 180 to 200 billion a year extra on top of what we already do. And in that particular context, I think it's also quite sobering to realize, maybe not so much for you as an audience, I don't quite have the picture of where you kind of come from, but the kind of usual crowd that I talk to, people will be thinking, yeah, well, you know, uh, innovation funding and so forth, that's uh, Horizon Europe, research framework programs and so forth and so on, and that's a lot of money. And then my usual message is, well, think of two things. One is, if you look at funding for innovation and technology and you just look at the research funding, about 20% of the research funding comes from the EU level, 80% comes from member states. But even more importantly, about 20% of R&I funding is public money, 80% is private money. And then you try to look at the specifics and you realize that for some of the really important players in the energy sector, their investments in clean energy technologies are just a fraction of what they spend on R&I every year. So for me, the big challenge is not so much knowing what to do, but it is to get the resources where they need to be in order to achieve it. And for people to pick up that particular challenge and move in that direction. This is where I think we still have an enormous amount of work to do. If we could just, you know, use all the R&I investments that we already have in terms towards um, getting the technologies where they need to be, and it, that would be an automatic thing, we would probably be less concerned. But we're not there yet. And that kind of curve is something that, uh, that I think is, is, is uh, quite interesting. All right. Then the last thing that I want to pick up as well by, by way of introduction is the modern energy system and the clean energy system is not something that relies on this technology here, that technology there, and so forth and so on, you know, uh, renewables through wind and solar or hydrogen here or whatever it is. It relies extremely on the combination of all the technologies that we have, bringing together all the elements in the system. And for me, therefore, the challenge is not only getting individual technologies where, the, uh, where they are, but in particular finding out how they interact. So one of the things that we're looking at in, in my neck of the woods these days is to really get to the bottom of, of not only what are the technologies out there and you know at what state are they, which ones should be pushed here and for, uh, so forth, but to, f to get the kind of analysis that we need to know where these technologies will fit in the energy system and how they will work together in order to get to the decarbonization results that we want to, uh, want to get to. So that's for me the next big challenge in energy R&I, that is to get to the way in, uh, to get more clear about the way the energy system as a whole works together. Well, I'm going to leave it there. And yeah, we'll take the debate where it goes. Yes, very good. Thank you very much, Heitzer. And this is, this is very much the point, isn't it? I mean, one of the fundamental shifts is not so much a shift as is a transformation. That is to say, we are going to move from a centralized energy system to a decentralized energy system, and that applies in some ways to, to, to investment as well as does deployment. You know, where, where do the renewable energy technologies, which we have to hand, again, part of the battle has been won so far as we've driven down the costs of, of wind and solar to a point where they are competitive with, well, much more competitive than coal, more competitive than new build gas, more competitive than nuclear, but how can that properly be funded? The, the, the Bloomberg New Energy Finance's most recent report uh, looking at investment said $13 trillion would go into, um, into renewable energy investment by 2050, but this needs to be trebled to actually be an effective uh, transformative power. So uh, thank you very much, Heitze. I take the, the mic over to, uh, to Matthias then. Would you like to make your opening views on, on energy transition in Europe and how this, uh, how this works going forward? Yeah, thank you, because uh, we are also talking about, let's say, what's the role of industry and uh, where are we? So I will concentrate a little bit on this, because I totally agree, of course, climate change is the biggest challenge. We have to be uh, become uh, CO2 neutral in 2050. Uh, we have certain targets um, in Europe and in Germany. And by the way, we are not on track. We are not on track in Germany. Uh, if you look at the CO2 reduction uh, in 2020 or in 2030, we are far away from this. And this is also true, let's say, if you look at the numbers, um, let's say, uh, all over Europe. And the second thing is we have to look at, and now I'm coming to industry, um, when, we make, when we talk about this transformation, we have to think about the following. Yes, the, 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 the technology might be there, but the technologies that are needed, where do they come from at the moment? And I'll give you just two examples, two examples. 
When we talk about the car sector, and we are talking about e-mobility, and give you the importance of this sector, 60%, 60 percent of the growth in the last 10 years in Germany came from what? And our, uh, automotive sector, uh, automotive sector. So we are very much dependent. We are, we are very much dependent on, let's say, um, on, on the, from the economic tone point of view on the car sector. And then now there's a big transformation. And what's the key for this transformation? It's uh, the battery and it's the cell. And if you look now, where does the battery in the cell, especially the cell, come from? Then you have to admit it's not coming from Europe. So we have, let's say, it's coming from Korea, from China. And if you look at the numbers that we need in the next years to, uh, to, uh, to, um, uh, to help our industry using this technology, then we have to invest you. We have to make huge investments in the, in the next years, huge. And I'm very happy about Northvolt, by the way, that we did this. But you look at this from scale point of view, um, Northwold is going to present, maybe they will build up a 32 gigawatt hour um, uh, plant together with, and then they will have an, a second um, uh, project together with Volkswagen, another 16 gigawatt hours. And now I give you the numbers that we need in Europe. This will be 400 gigawatt hours in, 20, in 2020. So the main investments and the main support um, and the main pipelines are not in Europe, but this is a key technology for the future. And so we have to think of how to build up this industry. And I'm coming to, to this, uh, come back to this a little bit later. We took a second, we, we took a second, uh, a second view on the PV industry. The PV industry started, by the way, uh, and was successful when Germany started its EEG, um, its EEG system. So feed-in tariff system. And then the Chinese went in. They w came on the market with dumping prices. And now, if you look, what do we have in Europe on the PV um, industry? Not much left. Not much left. So the big capa capa capacity is coming from China. And um, uh, uh, all from, again, from, from, from Korea. So all, with these two examples, and there are even more, I come to, let's say, the following conclusion. Europe, in certain technology fields, is not competitive, and we don't have the capacities that are needed. If you look, from, if you look at European production, that is needed for the transformations going to come. And this is not only an economic problem, it's also an economic problem, it's also a geostrategic problem. Give you one idea, if there is a PV monopoly by China, China is going to decide where capacities are going to be built. Or if you want to be premium in the car market, we can't be and shouldn't be dependent on decision by Korean car make or by, 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 by Korean uh, cell producers or Chinese cell producers because, because we can't be sure that we get the, the best technology that is needed for the transformation. And that is, and I could go, go through other technologies, give you one idea. AI is a key question for even more productivity in the energy sector, connecting things. We need um, other technology on the software side and so on. So what we need in Europe, and that is key for also for the energy transition, is that we have a clear view what are the technologies that are needed for the transformation. Second, where are we? Do we have them and can we scale up technology, the, these technologies? And how can we build up and restructure our industry and transform our industry in the, in the next year? That's a, the key question. And therefore we need one thing and we don't have it. We need a clear industrial policy strategy for Europe. And I was sitting in the, in the three councils on a European level and we always discussed this, but so far there's no clear industrial policy strategy on, let's say, certain things. And what we did by, by the way, by, um, 
with Inner Energy, we created the European Battery Alliance, 250, 250 companies in there. And now I give you the numbers how big this is. 200. If you look at the whole supply chain, the, the, the opportunity for European, um, for European industry would be in 2025 that you have a market of 250 billion along the whole supply chain. You could create three, three to four million new jobs in this area, but that means that we have to make, let's say, investments work and that we also need a framework that gives the right incentives. Because it's not, investments are only going to come if the framework, the policy framework, for example, a CO2, CO2 price is there that's going to push um, uh, the technologies in, into the market. And that's not, we are not there. And therefore, of course, we have to look for technologies, we have to look for, for, for innovations, but we have also to look at the policy framework and how can we build up um, um, industrial policy strategy for the next years uh, to make this happen. My last remark is because we have, which also, let's say, have some controversial things. I totally, yeah, I totally agree, I totally agree that this energy transformation is needed. And if you look at Germany, and I give you the numbers, we are now about 36, 37, 38 percent on renewables. We are on the track, we are on the track for, let's say, 55 percent in 2030 and at uh, 65%, 65% in 2030, so, and this will lead to the following, there will be huge investment in PV, because there's a big problem installing wind at the moment, because we don't have, there are a lot of problems. We need 59 months to get uh, the allowance for a, for a new wind turbine to be built in Germany, 59 months. So, and now, one thing is going to happen. We did this and we were, if you look at Europe, one of the first movers. And if you look now at the energy price, electric, electricity prices in Germany, you see the following. We have the highest in the world. The consumer prices are be, be, uh, above 30, um, 30, 30 cent per, per, per kilowatt hours. And if you look at industry energy prices, we have also the highest one. E even higher uh, than, um, than uh, um, uh, much higher than in other parts uh, of Europe. What I'm going to say, yeah, what I'm going to say, we have also, of course, bring this further on, and of course, renewables today are competitive. I agree, I agree, but let's say we have to look. That must be also cost efficient because this is very, very important for, let's say, com uh, competitiveness of our industrial sector for the future. So we have to combine these two elements, uh, investing um, into the future, bringing up you know, renewables, but also have, have to look at, let's say, to what, let's say, um, to what prices this is going to happen so that we are, have um, the opportunity to build, to have a competitive industry for the future. So there are targets, uh, there are conflicts of targets, and we have to solve these conflicts of targets. And therefore, we need a common approach. We need an industrial policy strategy. I, I look very much forward to the announcement of the Commission, let's say, to present something like a Green New Deal. That is one of the big headlines of the, of the new Commission. And I'm very uh, interested um, what, what this means. And a key, part of this, a key part of this must be two things. Having a clear incentive by a policy framework and having a clear industrial policy strategy so that we can make this transformation happen in Europe and be, let's say, leading not only on developing technologies but bringing them on the market and scale them up because that's the, uh, that's the, the most important thing we have to do um, and to show that we can, we can make the transformation or um, uh, in a developed uh, region uh, and this, this, this transformation um, is, is good for the climate, is good for the economy, and it's good for the employment. Um, so that is the, the test case, by the way, to make other, other parts and other countries in the world uh, 
um, uh, follow us uh, on this transformation strategy that is needed to reach the climate targets uh, in 2050. Thank you. Um, thank you, Matthias. <clears throat> and, and rightly, uh, there's a, a cost-benefit analysis, obviously, to be um, to be worked through it in, 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 in concentric circles from the from you know from the homeowner who may be uh, putting PV on his um, on his rooftop, uh, you know, out to the you know the widest um, industrial export strategy that a country may adopt to actually, as you say, develop the technologies, but also to and use those technologies, but also to uh, to build an economic case uh, for for export and 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 uh, for the development uh, on those technologies. Um, so moving on, uh, lastly, to uh, to Peter, would you like to make uh, give you some opening thoughts on uh, on the energy transition in Europe? <coughs> Thank you. Thanks, um, and, and thanks as well for the invitation. I, um, I thought I should sort of pick up on Claudio's point at the beginning to, uh, to be optimistic in, in, our, in our approach. So I thought let's, let's start sort of with the, the good news. I think um, if you look at you know, the way this commission has come into place, the priority given at this point to climate change is something that we haven't seen in the last five years. Uh, President Rousseau van Alaya has spent more time thinking about this than Juncker in his entire five years in office, I would suspect. So I think something has changed quite dramatically in the last basically six months. I think if you're speaking to anyone in the last six months ago, no one would have thought we would have this level of attention to the topic, would have this kind of a commission with this kind of priorities, this kind of European Parliament, uh, where the Green Group is actually the bigger group compared to the far right, where everyone was thinking this is going to be the election of where this, this will be decided, not by a big margin, by the way. The, the thing that makes it complicated is that we're getting to the hard part of the story here in terms of energy transition. I think everything has been done so far. A lot of the heavy lifting has been done by, for example, a country like Germany that has paid a lot of money, done a lot of heavy lifting in turn, turning these technologies cheaper. Now we're coming to the hard part, going from 30% to 70%, and in the end, not to 100% renewable power system, but to two, three, four hundred percent renewable energy systems, if we're looking at what's needed in industry and other places. Um, this is going to be really, really hard. And at the same time, the only thing that matters from a climate point of view is speed. How fast are we going to be doing any of this, right? That's the only thing that matters. It's not whether we do it, it's how fast we're going to be. Um, Doing it, and I think this is the sort of sort of central challenge that we have at the moment in the Commission, also with this European uh, Green Deal, is that it's going to have to do a number of things at the same time. It's going to have to get us on track in terms of decarbonisation, um, but it's also going to have to get us on track in terms of the industrial policy that we need to go with it. Um, I would add that we also need to get on track with a social policy, a labour policy that comes with it. Uh, we completely need to reskill. I mean, in Germany right now, the debate is about moving from oil to gas boilers. Um, we're in, so they're not even thinking about the kind of skills you need to actually install decarbonized heating systems, heat pumps, etc. Um, so there's a lot to be done there. We need a financial system that supports it. We need a green finance taxonomy to come along with it. We need a better understanding of climate risk, something that needs to be addressed in the financial sector reform that this commission um, is working on. So, huge amount to be done, huge expectations for this European Green Deal. And uh, in that sense, it might, be, it might actually be a good, a good thing. This commission needs one extra month to get itself to the starting line, so they have a bit more time to um, clarify their thoughts. And I, I think that applies to actually a lot of people in this um, in this discussion. Um, I, I want to make a couple of additional remarks to this. I think one of the things is that the decarbonization of industry isn't happening in a vacuum. I mean, there's, there, there, there are huge disruptive changes happening in the industrial sector. It has nothing to do with decarbonization. They're happening anyway. They're linked to technolo technological development, technological change, uh, digitization, 3D printing, etc. All these things were, are happening no matter whether we decarbonize or not. And one of the things we need to be careful about is when we talk about the social implications of all of this is that a lot of these social implications are because of digitization. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we reskill workers, how do we make sure we leave no one behind. Um, but of course in the industry, uh, the considerations are sometimes a little bit different. Keeping people on board also means keeping costs on board. 
uh, to put it very bluntly. Um, and there are pressures as well there. So I think to get this right, you need a commitment from the industry itself, from the, from the companies that matter, that um, they are also committed to keeping, to leaving no one behind. This is something you can't just uh, deliver through uh, a climate policy alone. Um, I think one sort of big test case for the industrial debate is going to be how much we're going to, how much time we're going to spend about talking about high carbon competitiveness and high carbon leakage in the industrial policy debate. This is what everyone talks about. This is why we're talking about carbon border, carbon tax adjustments. It's all about protecting Europe's high emitting industries from their competitors across the border. And how much are we going to be talking about low carbon competitiveness and low carbon leakage? Because Europe is not the only country that is facing these challenges. It's not the only country that has opportunities in terms of cheap renewables. Countries like Chile are in a very good position to take advantage of this. China and its current five-year plan is already out-investing the EU in terms of clean uh, technologies, by far. Um, so there is a race going on. There's a global race. And we need to make sure we're actually going to win that one. Um, and one of the key things there is to really change the debate from high carbon leakage to low carbon leakage and investing and making sure that Europe is the place where a lot of these leading technologies will actually be um, coming to scale and, and we maintain our leadership there. Um, maybe one point about the sort of geopolitical implications of a lot of these things, because you already mentioned, you know, China has uh, has advantages in, in the solar PV system. There is a much bigger risk beyond that, which is that China's potential leadership in clean energy technologies isn't just there. The, China has, of course, a very different political system. It has a it's developing a social, uh, it's, it's developing social rating system for its citizens. It's developing a total surveillance system. It's, it's, it's linking its clean technology development to a very, very different political system. I think if, we, if they win that one, we're in for some very, very deep fundamental problems. So it's not just in the in interest of climate change that we need to win this competition with China. It's also in the interest of our democratic, liberal system. If we want that to succeed, we need to make sure we keep, we're the ones setting the rules in those, in those, in those new markets, in those new sectors. So the stakes are a lot higher, even uh, even on that level. Um, maybe just on a sort of final, again, optimism. You know, I think it's interesting we're having this debate in Germany because if, I think I would say if there's any country that is able to be a leader on green industry, theoretically, in terms of you know the, the, the skilled workforce, the, the, the money, I mean, the money is for free right now here in Germany, right? To invest. So theoretically, this could all really happen here and and I, and I think if you look at the I mean the problem of course is the incumbents it's, 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 it's the attachment to things like coal it's the attachment to things like diesel but two out of the three German car in the in car companies have now said well we're going to we're going to say buy to diesel we're going to go full onto electric and whether that's too late too little I don't know we'll see but that's something um, so um, just to sort of close on an optimistic note um, yeah we might still have we might still make it. Thanks. Very good. Thank you so much. And this is a point, of course, you know, worth um, hopefully worth uh, discussing a bit further. There's, you know, decentralization does also mean democratization of energy fundamentally, uh, a shift toward um, <clears throat> toward in, into a renewables powered uh, global, you know, globally powered uh, energy system. Uh, fundamentally, uh, you know, will be uh, will in, will include uh, a, a power for all, you know, reality which you simply don't don't see currently on the planet. Um, I mean, I imagine that you know, interaction is, is always a better part of these sorts of panel debates. So if there are, you know burning questions that do emerge while you're uh, while you're hearing uh, our learned panelists uh, speak please do you know raise your hand and let um, let's have questions and, and comments uh, finding their way into this um, into this discussion um, I mean there's obviously a lot said in, in the first um, in, in uh, what our panelists have, have uh, made by way of opening remarks which um, which we could use to um, uh, to to advance the discussion now um, I personally uh, I'm quite um, having come out of the oil and gas industry myself I was a reporter for 13 years um, covering, uh, covering oil and gas principally offshore. <clears throat> um, one thing that I found perhaps most recently, the most, uh, most inspiring was a report that came out yesterday from the International Energy Agency, which uh, you may have seen because it was covered uh, quite unusually in all, in all the major broadsheets. Uh, you know, I think Die Welt did a piece, The Guardian, uh, The Independent, uh, San Francisco Chronicle, uh, Nikkei covered it. <clears throat> and that, that IEA report said that fundamentally offshore wind 
uh, is emerging very rapidly as one of the uh, engines of the energy transition. And uh, it, for reasons which, you know, uh, maybe reflect, refract off much of what we said to this point. Uh, there is, um, you know, we talk about the incumbents uh, and, and, the kind of, uh, and the kind of backward drag effect that, that they have. You know, Shell invests 3% of its, of its capital currently on a yearly basis in renewables, total 5%, ExxonMobil 0.1%. You know, if you look at the utilities in Europe, they've, they're going through an absolute upheaval uh, of, of business model uh, fundamentally because they've functioned in one way for some part of 100 years and those rules no longer apply or at least they won't apply uh, they increasingly will not apply as we're moving forward so when you look at when you look at Vattenfall when you look at RWE um, when you look at uh, you know, I don't know Centrica in the UK um, <clears throat> each is having to find a way of reinventing itself uh, and its business models to make the transition and there's a lot of blood on the carpet invariably uh, RWE is a particularly interesting case because as we were saying in our uh, speaking before before we had this panel, it's you know it's an angel and a devil at the same time. It has it has huge investment in renewables, not much in Germany, uh, but it's also you know still pushing ahead with uh, with defore deforestation deforestation pro projects to get at coal it wants to dig up. So um, sorry to come back to the offshore wind point. I actually wanted to uh, open discussion. Uh, I, I can I can asking uh, Heitzip a bit about that. I mean, um, new technology is is a lifeblood of any industry. I think we we probably all agree. Uh, the cost of offshore wind. A couple of years ago, it was treated as an experimental technology. Now it's come down to already under 60 euros a megawatt hour. Um, it is on its way to being much cheaper still. I mean, by some estimates, once we hit mid 2020s, we're going to be down to half that, perhaps better. Uh, the, it, it is, it is uh, subsidy free, effectively now, and it will be uh, increasingly so. Um, and yet, it's still treated as a, you know, rightly as a nascent technology. Only three, uh, only 0.3 percent of our global <clears throat> power demand is met with. Um, with offshore wind. Now, yesterday, the IA report said fundamentally that, we, you know, that this is a power supply that can meet the demand globally 18 times over. 18 times over. And that's just with the shallow water. If we get into floating wind, that is to say further offshore or 60 meters of water or deeper, then again, you can, you can magnify that 11 fold further. So, <clears throat> uh, what I was hoping um, I took a comment on, give us some, some thoughts on is, Okay, the UK is currently the, the, world, the world leader in offshore wind, but fundamentally we know that by 2030, 2040, <clears throat> it's very much, uh, very likely to have lost that, um, that front running position to China. Uh, Germany, uh, I, I presented at a uh, conference last year in Hamburg, which the central theme emerged as energy vendor mark two, offshore wind. Okay, if we, if we can't, if, if public resistance, if, if even if political resistance to onshore wind and PV is such that the actual uh, installation rates are going to drop substantially, are dropping substantially. Uh, can we not now make a fundamental shift to offshore wind? Uh, it brings in maritime industries, skill, we talk about skill transfer, it brings in oil and gas uh, industry, uh, offshore oil and gas industry skills transfer. Uh, it, could create, it could create a trillion dollar industry in the next 20 years. Offshore wind, how important will it be and, and what do you think for Europe? Well, um, I don't have a crystal ball. That's the, f that's the first thing. Uh, what I can say is that uh, on much of what you, what you said in terms of the potential, I would, I would agree. And uh, that's been going on for a while already. Huh? We, we, um, we know of the exponential growth rates of wind energy in general and offshore wind in particular, um, which have created jobs uh, at a rate that no other industry sector has been able to compete with. Um, and uh, obviously you have grown in the same way in terms of output and um, production capacity and so forth and so on. There, um, there are other nice things about uh, the renewable sector in general as well, which uh, I know is a bit of a, what you call it, a coffee table argument, but I still like it very much because it's one of those things that plays into the energy security kind of discussion, which is that every renewable energy has zero marginal cost. It's a very, very simple proposition. You don't pay for the wind. You do pay for the oil, you pay for the gas, you pay for coal, whatever it is. Um, so once you've solved the technology problem in terms of efficiency, in terms of maintenance and so forth and so on, and there's a lot of discussion going on about how to even further improve business models in that area, in any case, you already have um, uh, a good direction to go in. But, but the main thing I think we need to keep in mind, um, firstly, in terms of how it works, in terms of the energy system in Europe, it's not just getting renewable energy or renewable electricity out there. The whole energy system has to work with it and not every energy area or every energy system will function in the same way. 
uh, never mind the instability issues, which means that you need storage to compensate and so forth and so on, but you also have the geographical issues, and Germany is a case in point, where if you, go for, if you were to go for 100% offshore wind in Germany or a very high proportion of whatever it is, you inevitably get to the, the question, how are you going to get that to uh, the southern part of the country? And everybody who knows Germany a little bit knows about the debate about the nord süd trasse yeah, where people have a problem even if you dig the cable into the ground, apparently. Um, but, um, but, bon, I mean, these are realities that we have to face. That's one. The second one is that there is, in any case, and we keep on saying this, and this is one of the things that we really, really struggle with at our end, particularly with regard to what, what technologies are you know, driving the energy transition, is there is no silver bullet. There is not just one solution. It's not just offshore wind or onshore wind or hydrogen or solar or whatever it is. It has to be an appropriate combination of all these forms of energy plus an energy system that works with them. So I continue to belabor the point that this, the phase at which we are right now is not so much uh, knowing that we have the technologies or you know, what can be done, but is making sure that everything is put in place in order for those uh, technologies to be able to play their role as effectively as possible. And that's where I come back to what I said initially. This is not just a thing of either governments putting up money or the regulators uh, producing the nice uh, relevant regulatory system or whatever it is. It is also a very big responsibility for those who have the means to drive the change in industry to do so. Um, and they have an interest to do so. So one of, one of the things, for example, that strikes me is that there are enormous economic opportunities. We've, we've made the calculation that uh, this, the energy transition, simply as, as we forecast it right now at European level, could add up to 1% in terms of uh, GDP per year uh, in the European Union. It is, in a way, a, a slam dunk kind of scenario strong investment in cleaning up the energy system will increase competitiveness, will create jobs, will uh, transform the industry. But we need to get away from a, a situation where people think, whoa, my shareholders, I'm going to drive my profit levels down over the next five years, and whoa, whoa, no, I'm not going to go there. Uh, or, even more cynically, yeah, yeah, you know, clean energy is great, we're going to invest a little bit in this, but whoa, there's still a ton of oil over there, and that's going to bring us, you know, a billion over the next five years. That's the kind of mentality that needs to change. Now, in terms of the content, I just wanted to get back to some of the comments here. There is a lot of thinking going on for the moment in terms of the, of the Green Deal, and there's a lot of work that's gone on before that as well. Um, first of all, the Green Deal is not just about decarbonization. There is a whole element in there called just transition, which looks at how are we going to take European citizens with us and how are we going to take those regions in Europe with us that will have a hard time changing over from the current system, uh, not to mention coal regions in particular, to a situation where you are decarbonized, where you have a different type of, of industry uh, around you and so forth and so on. There is a whole thing about a climate pact, which is still embryonic as part of that discussion, which is particularly then about working with everybody and working with citizens on uh, the energy transition. In parallel, the work has already started, for, and some of you may have seen this, may have participated in it, on a new industrial strategy for Europe. And obviously, the two need to be linked up extremely closely, because uh, without a transformation of industry, we're not going to get to uh, where we want to go. So, all of that is very important. Uh, last thing that I would say in this whole discussion about competitiveness, um, first of all, it's, it's, it's absolutely correct huh, that we are, we're doing an enormous amount of work right now in terms of batteries. Uh, and batteries not only in terms of developing the next generation of them, but building up the value chain in Europe as well. But more uh, broadly than that, the, every penny we put into um, technology, innovation, being top of the world and remaining top of the world in clean energy technologies is something that will not only be profitable for 
us in Europe in terms of what we do with our own emissions, but it will be profitable as an export technology as well because every single country in the world will be looking at the possibilities to decarbonize as quickly as possible. You just referred to the IEA report on offshore wind. Uh, we already did calculations way uh, back, five, six, seven years ago, looking at the fact that it's changing, by the way, but bon, that Europe is the absolute top producer of offshore wind installations and at some point had over 90% of the installed offshore wind capacity in the world, which means that every other country that is interested in installing offshore wind potentially could use European technology to do so. That's the competitiveness angle of the whole story as well. So we have literally a whole series of wins down the road if we take the right steps and we take them now. And this is, of course, it's a point worth making if you look at what's happening in offshore wind off, off the east coast of the US, to all European developers and most European supply chain. If you look what's happening off Taiwan in offshore wind, guess who? Same incumbents, uh, but it's say, uh, European uh, offshore oil and gas developers, producers, and supply chain. Um, so just to pick up on this key point that, you know, fundamentally this is a transformative uh, change. It's a holistic change that's required. Um, finance, obviously, you know, there's a money trail to every, to every, uh, every change we're going to see. Uh, Matthias, but, uh, could I take, uh, ask you just to look a bit on, on the question of industrial strategy. Uh, industrial growth requires investment, and we know that the biggest bank in the land, the European Investment Bank, has postponed a decision on whether to continue investing in fossil fuel projects. Uh, they were supposed to take the decision um, earlier this month. They're pushing it back to November now. Um, you know, globally, we've, we saw a, st a stall for a year in new, um, or at least in increased investment in renewables. Uh, this is a very, a very dangerous signal to send, fundamentally, uh, to, the, to the private sector, to say, well, keep it in the ground, yeah, but, you know, the oil companies are making too much money for us to, to keep it in the ground, uh, fundamentally, or the coal companies, likewise. Um, I mean, what would you say fundamentally needs to be done here to, to, to change this attitude? Because whatever the, IBA, I, the EIB does, you know, private finance in some part will follow. Yep. Let me, let me start by saying, underlining what had been said before, we shouldn't concentrate on just one technology. We need a mix of different technologies. That's the key question. And by the way, we need a system. We don't have a real energy market in Europe, a common energy market in Europe, and we have different ways, let's say, of energy production. If you look at Poland, this is still 80, 90 percent uh, of coal production. If I look to France, there's a huge amount of uh, nuclear technology. So we don't have a real market. We don't have, let's say, a system that's going to use the advantages of different parts in Europe, sun, wind, storage capacity. So that's, to my mind, one key question. Uh, that we have to develop, uh, and um, otherwise um, we are not, we will not be able to make the trans uh, transformation work. The second thing is, I come back to this, we have to give the right signal, that's also the key question for, um, for the transformation, is that we have a key, let's say, price and other signals. We have an ETS system in Europe, that's true, but this is, this is only for industry and energy. It's not there for the housing sector, it's not there for the mobility sector. So we need, the next step must be a joint ETS system, a joint ETS system for, for, from energy let's do to, to mobility that we make the transformation work. Otherwise, um, otherwise we don't get, uh, let's say, the framework that is, uh, that is needed. So if you look at Germany, give you one answer, what well, we did just, we are now establishing our own ETS system for mobility and uh, the housing sector. And you know how we start? By 10 euros a ton. This is nothing. You can, you can stop. This is not going to, this is not, this is absurd, absolutely. This is not going to help to, uh, to, help to bring the technologies in, uh, in, into the market. And by the way, that is the biggest problem. That all the investors I know, and I talked with a lot of them, they are not sure about the framework, the policy framework that's going to come on regulation, on uh, pricing system, but that's key for their investment decision. And therefore, I hope the, the Commission is going to give the right signals that, yeah, I hope it's going to come, yeah, it's going to, yeah, uh, because that's key.
key for investment decision for in many, many sectors. Um, and that is, of course, investment is a uh, scaled investment um, uh, is, um, is the key for, for making the transformation. And third, yeah, that's all fine, but I'll give you one number. We have a wonderful wind industry in Europe. Do you know what's happened there? They are, they are going to reduce employment. Investors and others are going to reduce employment because the growth, there's no real growth strategy or growth path for wind industry in the next years. So, and that are the challenges where I'm going to say we need a couple of key decisions also how to make wind, let's say, to a, to a, to a safe um, growth, bring wind on a safe growth path, building up um, a PV industry, um, um, so key components um, of, the, uh, of the transition. And third, and you, you said this, how to bring people within the game. Now I'll give you a little, a little, some little numbers on what's going to happen in the German car industry, yeah? because that's also a part of a transformation. When you, buy, when you build a diesel car, a diesel, you need 10 employees. If you build um, a, 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 a normal gasoline car, you need three. And if, if you build an electric car, you need one. And if you look at all the, the car in the, uh, the whole car sector in Germany and the whole supplier sector, what's going to happen? They are reducing employment dramatically. This has to be done, to make, to make this very clear, this has to be done. Because we have to transform, we have to go away from, from diesel technologies and all this stuff going in there. But we have to build up new perspective in other industries. We have to, co to compensate and we have to build up the skills in certain sectors. And we don't have them so far. We don't have them. When we talk about battery cell production in Europe, do you know what the problem is? We, are not a, we, we can't show today that we are able to make a solid production. Because that's key because there's no player on the market and we have to build up the qualifications for building up the system. We don't have it so far. So this is huge investments have, have to be done. And by now I'm coming to the financial sector. They are going to look at this and they see a lot of insecurities. And by the way, that Northwold worked. There were two players who make Northwold doable. One was the EIB. By the way, to be very open and frank between us, no other bank would have given a company that only exists as a PowerPoint because they didn't produce one single cell so far, giving them 300 million. And the second one that was even at least as important as EIB was who? Volkswagen. Without, without Volkswagen going to say, I give you 800 million, I'm going to invest in there, no other banks beside, beside the, 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 uh, the EIB would have joined. So what I'm going to say is we need also to show by building up ecosystems, building up partners between newcomers on the market and big companies to make the financial sector think about doing these kind of investments because they are risky, to be very, to, to be very clear. To be very, these are risky investments because there are big competitors who have already built up in the battery cell production an economy of scale. So that is our challenge. So new ecosystem bringing new technologies together, innovators bringing together with established companies and building up business cases. I'm stopping in one second. <laughs> um, uh, bring, and bring together to make this um, uh, investment goal. And secondly, building up, we need an energy market, a European energy market that, that's going, to, going to, to help to, to bring together the advantages of different energy, let's say, systems and different energy um, uh, uh, surroundings like wind, sun, storage capacities to make uh, this transformation go and we are not there. 
and we have to create this. Okay, very good, thank you. I just asked you a couple of questions in the audience, but I just want to give uh, Peter, a, I'm also keenly aware that we're sort of time is marching on here. I want to give Peter a, a chance to answer a question which I think actually may wrap in some of these points. And a lot of this is about risk. Fundamentally, this is, this is it, you know. Uh, what, what risk to financial communities, what risk, risk to, to, to uh, large industrialists that are undergoing a transformative change, you know, what risk to, to, to the population of this planet who faces, uh, who faces uh, climate resilience uh, you know, issues coming up. And, and Peter, you, uh, in a recent presentation, uh, looking at decarbonization uh, and, and how the EU might uh, maintain pole position uh, in, in, uh, in the industrial shift, uh, you, you, you made exactly this point that you know, uh, we are at risk of missing opportunities, uh, as well as systematically underestimating the climate risk to, to, uh, to supply chains. Uh, could you just say something on um, what we need to do to put the spurs to the wider EU industry, much as has been, has been talked about already by our other two panelists uh, to get ahead of, of, of the competition now in, uh, in low-carbon manufacturing powered by renewables, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, so no, th th this, is, this is something we were struck by when we, when we looked at, I mean, la last summer in Germany it was incredibly hot and dry and, and that was sort of the first moment when I think a lot of companies realized that, that there was a vulnerability uh, at that point that just manifests itself in terms of um, basically um, um, moving stuff from bigger to smaller ships so they could still reach the, 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 the sites. Um, and then the debate immediately went into, so obviously we need a deeper river, right? So we just keep digging the river so we can keep the... So that's the level of debate at the moment. Um, we, we had a chance to speak with some colleagues from the, um, the Ministry of Economic Affairs here in, in, in Berlin earlier this week, and they were asking us, well, have, do you know any study has looked at systematic climate risks for industry in Germany? Like, has anyone done this? They're not aware of it. No one has done it. But this is huge. And the level of debate is, well, should we spend all our money just make the Rhine a little bit deeper so we can keep the same boats, right? So that's, I think, the level where we are at the moment. So there's a huge net knowledge gap in terms of climate risks, which is then, of course, uh, working its way into the kind of decisions people are taking. So the way, and I think the place to address that is what I mentioned earlier, is the green financial sector reform. So when it comes to disclosure rules, when it comes to the kind of questions banks ask when providing the money is, have you understood this? Have you looked into this? Have you looked at your supply chain? Where are your vulnerabilities? Um, in terms of climate change um, and make this mandatory and set standards around that. So this is one area where the EU could be doing a lot more in the coming years. Um, I think, I mean, the, just, just to take, the fact, I mean, the EIB, of course, is a, key, is, is a key issue right now. And I think it's no secret that one of the problems, one of the reasons we don't have an agreement is because Germany is unclear about uh, the gas. I mean, they want to keep the option open of investing more into gas. Um, and I think that's, um, that, that is something that's going to be a bigger problem as, as we move ahead, because the key question with the whole gas debate, to what extent will we have gas, renewable gas, or not? It all comes down to two questions in the end. is either where are you going to put the CCS if you want to go through, through blue hydrogen, and particularly in Germany, be very clear where you want to put the CCS and how you're going to do that. If you can't answer that, you don't have a future for gas. Or which country in the world is on track to a 400 renewables power system, building electrolyzers and getting ready to export to Germany? Mm. In which time frame? Because if you can't answer that, well, they're not, they're, they're not, they're not on track to 100 percent renewables uh, power system. Unless you can answer that, I think so. What we're going to be looking at in the next couple of years is some hard choices we're going to have to make. Same with Bavaria. If they don't want to have power lines going into Bavaria, they don't want to build the windmills, RWE is not sure if they want to build the gas plants because they're not sure it's going to make sense economically. Someone's, something's going to have to give at some point. I think that's what's going to make things interesting. We can't just keep having the theoretical debates. Someone's going to have to put their money somewhere now. And then I think we'll, we'll, we'll start moving again. Yes. So business as unusual, I think, is the, the term I hear more and more uh, often used, uh, fundamentally. The fellow here, you want to pose a question? And there's another one here, directly behind you. Hello, uh, my name is Felix. Uh, thank you. Um, I want to pick up on the point. Uh, you said that we have a quite uh, diverse energy system in Europe, also quite diverse governments. And um, my question is, um, because we're at the 
quite interesting point now in, in Germany. Uh, the German government said they implemented as much as they could in the new climate package, as, as much as the democracy basically could stand and the citizens could stand from a uh, additional um, cost point of view for the citizens, I'd say. So uh, what would you say, is it worth it for a country to progress more than others, to be a leader in clean technology? Uh, and is it worth it for the European Union uh, to be a leader in clean technology or do we have to um, commit um, to common goals or even more to common actions first because we have common goals, we have the Paris Agreement, but we have to get to common actions or has there to be a, a single leader first who spends more money and people who kind of suffer compared to other people in other countries because they have higher costs and um, the industry is struggling more? That's my question. Yeah, the answer is clear, yes, and I think politicians tend to underestimate what people are willing to to do, particularly if you do things in a very clumsy way, as Macron did, and I mean, I've never seen so much talk about such one protest movement in, 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 in France, as in the case of, uh, of that. I, th I think the key problem is just basically how the human mind works, which is that we're very risk averse as, as, as a human species. We, we tend to uh, be very concerned about losses, we want to avoid losses at all costs. We're not very concerned about not winning things in the future. Just as the way we've been, through evolution, we've, we've, we've been programmed. I think one of the big risks in this whole debate is that we tend to overblow, to make this bias worse in the whole debate by talking about, and I, I think in the coal debate is a case in point. I mean, it's logical that we started the transition debate with coal because it's been such a big supplier of the energy system, it's been, such a contributor to climate change, etc. But if you look at the debate in the coal sector on transition, people tend to over-romanticize and see the past as, as, as wonderful, as these are well-paid jobs, this was all about, you know, we had status, etc., uh, etc. Et people don't realize that, you know, what, I mean, if you ask the question then, who, who would send your own, who, which one of you would actually send your own kids and recommend them to go work in the mines as well? Very few would, but there's, so there is, there is a sort of discrepancy there, and I think we need to be really careful about how we look into the old economy and, 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 and the way we look into, into the opportunities. And I think that's where you know, there is a clear job for politicians to really uh, try not to make things worse by saying, oh, everything was so wonderful and we don't know what the future will look like. We never know what the future will look like, right? We do know, by the way, that if we don't act, the, right, the path we're on right now is going to look very ugly. So I think that's a real it's, 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 it's a problem of political leadership where we just need more of it. And I think if the German government says something like that, to me that seems like an invitation for elections. Yes. Yeah, let me start by a general remark. What has to be understood by politicians and by, by the way also by the economic sector, the most resource, energy and CO2 efficient economic system or region will be the most competitive one. That's my first remark. And if you think from this point of view, of course, you have to be, you can be, if you are a first mover, you can have advantages. By the way, we had this. When we start with the EEG, look what happened. From nothing, from, from zero to something, we created new industries. Wind industry, solar industry, and so on. And, um, so that's my, my principal remark. Now to, to what we did. By the way, Germany took, a, took over a leading role. We said the, uh, the, the European target in 2030 is 40% CO2 reduction. Germany says 55. When you look at renewables, we say 65%, uh, let's say, uh, renewables in 2030. This is far above everything, far above everything um, that's, uh, in Europe. And now I'm coming back to, to, let's say, what have been decided in the German government. This is a huge, uh, now they make a huge mistake. Yeah, very simple. If you give, if you act too late, you have only two options. On the path to 2030, you have to intensify your instruments, you make them harder, even you have to bring on, let's say, gold or instruments on the market that are not doable. Or you can't reach your targets. And I'll give you one simple, one simple number. In the car sector, in the, in, the, in the mobility sector, Germany 
made zero reduction since 1990. Yeah. And this leads down to the following. We have in the la last 11 years, the next 11 years, we have to reduce CO2 by 42.5%. This is huge. By the way, this can't be done only by electric cars. Because you, you will not renew the fleet as fast as needed, yeah, to the whole fleet, uh, to make this possible. So what we need is, and therefore pricing system and other things are so important that, that you give the right pricing system. So there's a change in investment change in behavior, same uh, a change in, let's say, uh, co consumer activities and, and their choices. And that has not been done. So we postponed this. The decision of the German government means postponing this up to 2026. And then hoping that we get uh, a combined ETS system between, from energy, uh, uh, energy, industry, mobility, housing sector, then all over Europe. So that's the approach. To my mind, we are losing time. We are losing momentum for investments. We are losing momentum for bringing new technologies into the market. And I agree uh, what, um, um, what you have been said. They are there, but you need the right economic framework to bring them into the market and make, let's say, scalable or big scale investment possible. And so that's the challenge. And I hope, because if you look, the main player in the last years to, to make a change in Europe was who? The European Commission. We, have, we would have never, and I, I was part of the, the, the negotiations uh, in two ministries, a state sector in the environment and a state sector in the economy, without, let's say, very bold targets from the European Union, member states, also Germany, wouldn't have done this. So the commission was the main driver. And I'm coming back to this. The Green New Deal must be a key incentive for the next years and must give some guidelines all over, let's say, from, for, with different parts, financing, innovations, infrastructure, and so on. And my last remark, and then I'm going to stop, is the following. I think that's also the problem of our debate today here. We are too much concentrating on technologies that are there. I don't think we have to talk a lot of PV or, or, or global or wind. I think this is going to come. What we have to talk about is the future, the technologies that we need and that we have to be, let's say, a leading a part of the world. And that is storage, batteries, hydrogen, and all this. This is the future because we will not be able With, let's say, without a big amount of, of hydrogen, we will not be able to, let's say, to decarbonize in the next years. But this must be based, of course, uh, on renewables. So we have to concentrate on the future issues, and we have to build up policy framework, innovation networks, ecosystems to bring these new technologies for tomorrow yeah, on the market, and not only concentrating on those things that are there, and they will go on the market. Um, so future innovation, this could, should be concentrated. It must be in the focus of a European industrial policy strategy. Very good. Thank you, Matthias. And just in the interest of egalitarianism, uh, Heite, uh, final thought. I don't want to be very long. Um, one is, where's the risk? And I think the risk is linked to the way in which we deal with externalities, uh, which you know is wrong, fundamentally. And two, um, Everybody looks at government or the EU, or whatever it is, but let's not forget that the EU is 400 million citizens, and I don't know how many thousand companies, and they are what constitutes the EU. I'm sorry, but we need to really cut, otherwise the next panel uh, will not start, or will not finish in time, but I would like to thank everyone.